and we're here at the ID Tech X show. And hi. Hi, my name's Scott White. I'm Chief Executive of Pragmatic. And what you've just been seeing is one of our wafers of flexible integrated circuits. So these are uh, very thin, flexible integrated circuits, uh, much thinner than a human hair, just 10 microns or so. It's a bunch of processors blowing in the wind. <laughs> yes. It's very light. In this case, they're actually uh, RFID circuits, radio frequency identification, um, which is one of our key target markets. Um, so they get assembled onto an antenna like this. You can see the antenna there and one of our flexible integrated circuits just uh, crossing over the top of it there. It's very small, right? It is. Uh, it's, although it's larger than an equivalent silicon chip, and that actually has a benefit because we can use it to provide the crossover of the antenna. So one of the advantages of our technology is not only is it thin, flexible, and very low cost, but it also allows you to save costs elsewhere in the system uh, by simplifying other aspects of, uh, of the total solution. So the RFID kind of antenna kind of market is pretty big, right? It is. Uh, this year, I think it's about 20 billion tags. Uh, 20 billion? Year. Yeah. Just this year only? Yes. So this is how you get to trillions? Yes. So it, that 20 billion is still limited by the cost and form factor of silicon-based RFID which means it can only be used on relatively high value items. So clothing in particular is, is the biggest market by far. Uh, you can imagine putting it on an item of clothing that costs $100 is quite justifiable for a tag that costs 10 cents, say. Uh, but if you want to extend that to everyday items that you might interact with, like a bottle of water or a tube of toothpaste, to be able to track that or have it engage with consumers, then you need a much lower cost point. Uh, and that's where our technology comes in. By enabling that, it can push the same kinds of applications to a much wider range of uh, products. So, um, in my previous video, there was a lot of comments about uh, people are asking, why is it a wafer? Why is it in the shape of a wafer? So, the main reason there is that a lot of the processing techniques we use are similar to what is used in conventional electronics manufacturing. So, actually, when we're making it, uh, the, the plastic is coated onto a glass wafer so that it can be presented to equipment and look something like a silicon wafer. Um, so this can be used in standard wafer processing equipment so we can still get very good accuracy, very high yield, uh, and very mature uh, equipment and processes uh, in order to make this. So using, s like, um, the semiconductor industry is huge and making wafers the way they do it. Uh, it's not quite the way they do it. It uses similar equipment and similar processes, but we use different materials, which are much lower cost, and also the way we've adapted our process means the, uh, the types of equipment we use as well as the processes are also much lower cost and much higher throughput. And what, do you, what is this showing? So uh, this is effectively how it's presented to our customers. So we, we produce it as a wafer on glass. It then gets released from that. Uh, but you know, if you just have this very thin, flexible wafer waving around, it's very hard to actually do anything with that practically. So it's presented on what's called a wafer frame. This is, so it's basically stuck onto here, so that then you can use very high speed uh, pick and place or flip chip machines to attach this to the antennas. But it looks like it's more like it could be printed in a big thing like this instead of a wafer, but you still, that's the only way this machines is what are the, built. This is what the, uh, the very high speed flip chip machines are used to handling. So this is actually the easiest way to get uh, products to market is to reuse the existing um, format that they're expecting to see. What's a flip chip machine? Flip chip is it's basically a pick and place, so it's a robotic system that can pick up each individual chip. In the case of flip chip, it picks it up, it flips it over, so it puts the contacts face down and then presents it onto the antenna and bonds it to the antenna with a conductive adhesive. How long time does it take to make one wafer? Uh, so the production cycle time for our process is less than 24 hours. So you compare that to a silicon fab where it would be typically a couple of months start to finish to produce a wafer. Start to finish? Yeah, is less than 24 hours. It takes the month? Months? In a silicon fab, typically, um, depending on exactly how you batch up the process, uh, you're looking at between four and 12 weeks, typically. That's a long time. Yeah, so silicon, you have some very uh, high temperature processes um, that you know take quite a long time. And also, the way the way uh, because of the way the equipment works in a silicon fab, the process has to be batched so you don't have each wafer going you know, straight from one process to the next. 
Uh, in our case, we have a single wafer flow, so it's a very efficient movement of material through the system, as well as each of the individual process steps are much faster. We don't have any of the lengthy, high temperature processes you find in a silicon fab. And in the last video, one of the highlights, and we started the video talking about ARM. So that was in a specific size that was a little bit bigger than what you're doing now, right? Yeah, so we've, um, we've seen a, a progression of our technology in terms of reducing the feature size and the overall density of circuitry. Uh, it's still obviously not, not going to be at the same level as silicon, and to be honest, that's not what we're aiming for. But if we can reduce over time uh, the size of our circuitry, then that means we can do more complex circuits in a, in a reasonable footprint and a reasonable yield. So this is the, um, the most recent version of the, uh, the Cortex-M based SOC that we've been doing with ARM, uh, which is about half a square centimeter or so in size now. Uh, and that's not actually in our latest version of the technology. So, so yeah, we do think there's substantial scope to reduce that in size further. This is similar to Cortex-M0? It's based, on, it's based on ARM's standard Cortex-M0, but it's an, it's an SOC, so it includes the memory and I.O. and so forth as well. Um, it's not a full general purpose microprocessor. So uh, one of the things that you know, intentionally we're focusing on with our process is how do you move away from completely general purpose architectures where you're using software and actually be able to optimize the hardware design at the point of tape out. And we can do that because for us, the cost and time scale for doing a tape out is far lower than in silicon. So, how far is it from something like this, actually you can plug it in and start using? Uh, that's still probably a, a little way off. Um, you know, our main focus at the moment is scaling up production for, for our RFID circuits. That's a market where there's, as I described before, you know, very well established volume requirement. Uh, and a clear need for our technology to be able to drive that into a wider range of products. Um, what we're doing on the Cortex-M uh, project is really developing the roadmap for how do we uh, add more functionality over time, and that will expand the range of uh, things that we can put our technology into. But so for now, it's going to be mostly uh, for these kinds of things, like this and That's like right. that. That's right. And this, uh, so this is a fairly standard uh, type of uh, RFID tag architecture where it's on plastic substrate with an aluminium antenna. Uh, this is an example of really where things are moving towards, which is a paper substrate and a printed copper antenna. Uh, this copper antenna is done by a partner of ours called Coprint. Um, and what that means is you have the, uh, the ability to make it much more environmentally friendly, um, both with the use of the paper substrate as well as the printing um, in order to produce the antenna. All right. Uh, so, so what's next? Uh, what are you working on? What kind of challenges do you have? So, as I said before, our main focus at the moment is on scaling up what we're doing on the RFID side. The commercial take-up for that has already been uh, very strong. Um, within the first two months after launching our first products, we had orders for over 20 million chips, uh, and that's continued to grow since then. Um, that's also expanded into a wide range of different application sectors. So while uh, perhaps 12 months or so ago our main focus was on consumer goods packaging, that's still a big focus, but we've had other areas that have also become quite important. For example, healthcare and, and medical. This is an example um, from a partnership we announced a couple of weeks ago with Shriner Medifarm, uh, who are a leader in uh, smart uh, labels and, and devices for medical and pharmaceuticals. So which part is your part? Uh, well, you can't actually see it here because it's, it's inside the label, but basically it's an RFID-enabled um, label um, so that actually you can identify uniquely uh, the item as well as tracking things like use by date and so forth. And um, so you have uh, all kinds of partnerships I saw your take at the Smooth and Sharp. Yes. So uh, this is about RFID stuff? Yes, yeah, so in the RFID market, our direct customers are the RFID tag or inlay manufacturers. So the companies that make these kinds of uh, inlays, they're called, uh, which is basically a complete RFID tag with the antenna plus the chip. So that's in companies like Smooth and Sharp that you saw, as well as the likes of Avery Dennison, um, who's actually a strategic uh, shareholder in the business. They then sell to the label companies and so forth and the, the brands 
that are using the product at the end of the day. But we also work closely with the brands ourselves in order to understand the, the use cases they have and what they want from our technology in the future. So the, the previous way they would do this is by doing hybrid. Now it's going to be more kind of like, a, it's still hybrid, but it's with a flexible CPU? Yeah, so the, the conventional way of doing tags looks very similar, but instead of our flexible IC, it has a bare die silicon IC. And that would still come on a, a wafer frame like this, but instead of our flexible wafer on there, you'd have a silicon wafer that's been diced up into the RFID circuits. So the, the model for our customers is very, very similar, but it just gives them a solution that has a much thinner, more flexible, more durable form factor and much lower cost. And so what's the status of the company? You're a big team, you have doing lots of cool stuff. You, maybe you can introduce a Yeah, so we have, we have 85 people at the moment. Um, and you know, the, at the moment we're at the transition really into volume manufacturing. So the RFID circuit's taking off. One of the things we've launched recently is what we call our Flex IC Foundry, where we're working with third party design houses to design their own circuits. So perhaps to describe that, I'll introduce Richard Price, our CTO. All right, and we can swap the mic right here. So this is, uh, it's getting a lot of views right now on my YouTube channel, this, this stuff. This is really unique in the world, no? This, this tech. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as Scott just said, we've uh, we've recently launched our Flex IC Foundry service. So that allows um, designers to use our process design kit, and they can come up with new application designs, and we can work with them then to go through multiple design iterations um, and fabricate those designs for them. So whereas typically in the silicon world, that would be um, you know a six month process minimum, and might cost you a few million dollars. We're much, much cheaper than that because of our different cost point and our much more rapid manufacturing. So it allows you to do these multiple design iterations and really optimize the, uh, the products. And I think you know, we said uh, yesterday at the presentations, we announced a couple of our beta partners there. So Arm, uh, as you know, we've been working with for a number of years, uh, including on the, uh, the Cortex-M uh, development, uh, iMac as well that we've worked with previously uh, as part of um, a collaboration in a European project, uh, including developing uh, an award-winning design for RFID for um, playing cards, uh, along with Carter Mundy. And then some of the other partners there were Talking Things, who were also um, uh, producing RFID tags based on our connected products, but they're moving into designing their own RFID uh, proprietary circuits as well. So I think it's a really big step for us to, to open this up and we're really excited about the types of applications that people are gonna uh, come up with and we look forward to making those as well. So if you go over here on the, on, on the wall that you have right there, uh, it says Flex IC Foundry. So you are fab, basically, and you provide EDA tools kind of uh, we, for, for f uh, fabulous, the semiconductor companies, designers, to do their own Exactly, stuff? so um, we, we've developed our PDK uh, using standard EDA okay. tools, um, and that allows fabulous uh, design houses to come up with their own designs. Um, as we said, this, you know, some of the features there, we got very low tape out costs, uh, much, much lower than they would get with a typical silicon uh, ASIC and we can do these very rapid design cycles. And we can work flexibly in a number of ways. So we can either work one-on-one -on -one directly where a complete uh, wafer will be designed for one partner, or we can do multiple uh, project wafers where we can manage, we can manage that confidentially, uh, confidentiality across multiple partners. So how low is the cost? Do you talk about this? It's like orders of magnitude? It's orders of magnitude. Many orders of magnitude. Many orders of magnitude, yeah. So, yeah? you know, we're, we're typically in the, you know, the tens of thousands there. So, totally affordable to start doing crazy new things. It's, it's really is affordable for any, anyone from universities to companies to start to think about new applications and, and yeah, crazy things. Uh, but when you look at this chip over here, the arm, right? Uh, How soon? How? What's the? What's the? What's the challenge to make it work? The, the challenge is really twofold. I mean, one is we uh, 
we have a full production uh, backlog, really, around RFID, so we're, we're delivering those products to our customers. And the other is just continuing to evolve our process in terms of maturity, so we can yield this type of product um, across the whole wafer, and then it becomes really commercially viable. We're going to be continuing to evolve our design rules over the coming years. Uh, we know we can shrink the footprint of this much further. Uh, and, and also improve some of the other performance metrics there as well by shrinking the, uh, the critical dimension of our devices. So, uh, in the previous video we did, you're talking about having a fab ready for billions of yeah. devices, right? How soon are you, uh, how far are you in this process? Is so, this, how much are you shipping? So our first, our first fab, it's called FlexLogic. It's a, it's a completely automated, self-contained um, clean environment around about 15 square meters of clean room. Uh, this has a capacity of a billion circuits a year already. We're designing our second generation, which will have a higher capacity. Um, based on the, the kind of Kinetic RFID products, that's going to be around about 5 billion circuits a year. So we're pretty much there in, in getting into the billions. The next step for us is moving into the tens of billions and then into trillions of units. But uh, you have the capacity, how about shipping that many? Are you getting there? Are you there? Or how, is it yeah, so Scott said, you know, with the, the last sort of year to 18 months, we've been transitioning from a technology business into a manufacturing. Um, so we're at that point now, we've got uh, orders in the tens of millions that we're starting to ship. And uh, next year is going to be about increasing that into uh, in even higher volumes. So when, when we look at this ARM chip, which is kind of like a Cortex-M0, uh, but it's not yet ready for to work. So what what kind of uh, architecture works now? What kind of uh, you know architecture? So um, mostly what we've done to date has been digital uh, logic gates. So you know that that worked very well in our technology. Uh, we we're adding additional analog functionality onto our uh, roadmap. So things like analog to, to digital. Um, and that's for a range of sensor applications. So again, with ARM, we've been developing a uh, machine learning processor as part of a project with uh, Unilever. This is for odor sensing, and it's based around a flexible neural network. Um, and this, uh, this is also a big exciting step for us, and we think not only is that applicable for odor sensing, but you can imagine food spoilage and other things where there's a uh, volatile organic signature that can be detected uh, in this way. All right, so looking forward to what's next. And this is happening a lot in the UK, right? Is yeah, it Cambridge? I mean, or? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of our application and uh, design work is happening in Cambridge. We obviously work closely with ARM there. Um, but you know, we're collaborating across Europe and North America and, and increasingly in Asia as well. So it's not just a, a UK activity.